Our speaker this afternoon is Keith Lyle. Uh, Keith is a member of our committee and he's also a member of the IOSH Rail Group. He's worked in the rail industry for a number of years and has over this time developed an interest and a knowledge and a degree of passion about fatigue. And he's going to talk to us about the management of fatigue this afternoon. And I know that some of it will be slanted towards the railway, knowing Keith and, and the background from that side. But I'm sure there are lots of things that just cross over into all our working environments from that. And everyone should be able to pick something up from the presentation. Can I ask you, Keith, just to share your presentation with us, please? Well, do Fred. I don't know how to follow that from from George and, and, and Louise. I almost caught George speechless there. I think for the first time ever. So yeah, give me two seconds and we'll share this. So hopefully everyone can see this. Let me know if anyone can't see that. So I'm working off a laptop. So please Your excuse me. Presentation's up, okay. Thanks. That's fine. Okay. So uh, fatigue is uh, an issue a lot of people will be aware of, and what I'm going to do today is look at. Bit of background on what fatigue is, as as uh, as chair said, there been rail industry since two thousand and five, two thousand and six. Prior to that, it was you know oil and gas offshore, and you know a construction rail bias. So there's a, a little bit of bias towards rail because it is a key issue for us. But the issues around fatigue and and sleep uh, and the, the causes and effects of that are common amongst any industry not just those that work night shifts or unusual shifts. Uh, and generally, as you, as the Chair said, it's understanding for, for fatigue, it's how to manage it and how to do that well is, is not easy. So uh, what I'm trying to do today is get a bit of discussion on what works, what doesn't work, where we can go and, and what the future potentially is for fatigue management. And again, it's not, the, it's not the easiest and it's certainly not the most exciting issue, but it deserves a bit of attention. It's getting a little bit more focused. Two seconds. So, uh, I suppose the first question in terms of any kind of briefing, and again, this, this covers some basic elements of fatigue, what fatigue is. So we've got a few definitions of fatigue, and unsurprisingly, fatigue is extreme tiredness, you know, resulting from uh, exhaustion, exertion, illness. So a few definitions here from a dictionary from the HSE, the second one there is a decline in mental and physical performance because you're tired. Uh, and the, the third one is, is a specific uh, railway reference from the Office of Road and Rail, which is perceived weariness. I'm not sure about the perceived right now because it is a, it's a physical thing. So you're physically exhausted from, you know, insufficient rest and inadequate sleep. So... <laughs> It's interesting to some degree to look at that, to think that the, the simplest thing in the world is if you are tired, you are fatigued, and it's due to lack of sleep. That might be a very basic thing to cover, but it's a good place to start, and I think it's a, a very common one. And I think that over the last couple of years, through lockdown and, and the pandemic, we are looking at this and trying to take something... I don't know if you can take a lot positive from it, but one of the positive things we have certainly encountered is the increased awareness and understanding of physical and mental well-being. And I know lots of people on this call as safety professionals will be well aware of mental well-being and mental ill health over the last 20 years even. I think that companies and organisations have been, I suppose, forced to some degree to take that on board over the last couple of years to look at work-life balance, stress, fatigue, in general well-being terms. So I think there's a bit better understanding nowadays on how this should be managed. Hybrid working is pretty much the norm nowadays. You know, I'm, I'm in a remote office today, which is, you know, two or three days a week will be populated by staff. So as I said, this will be a bit of an overview of, of what fatigue is and, and what the causes are, but Again, I've stolen some information here from the Rail Safety and Standards Branch Board, RSSP, as well as the URR and the HSE. So sleep deprivation, as I've said, it can have really harmful effects on you. So what can cause fatigue? So you've got your work. You know, your workplace can, in terms of what the building is laid out like, what your, what your workplace is like, can 
make you fatigued. You know, you, you're, you, there is still a thing called sick building syndrome. I'm sure that still exists, but your, your office environment, the heat, we talked briefly about that earlier on, about I'm in an office just now where the heating's on and the air conditioning's on in different parts of it, windows and doors are open and closed. Not a great environment. It's too hot in some places, too cold in others. Lighting, uh, your, your physical environment. And so then your work, what do you do? You know, do you have a very physical job? Do you have a job that mandates you work? Nights, days, or what, what you call a, your working pattern there, what you call a regular, irregular pattern. So if you do a combination of back early nights or day and night shifts, not at a two months on one and then two months on another. If you do two days and then three days on different ones, that will have an effect on you. Your body tries to regulate itself. You know, under normal circumstances, lots of problems to do with your stomach and what that can actually do. Stomach related issues in terms of digestion. You're trying to feed yourself when your body's wanting to sleep. So it's a, a individual factors that you may have yourself. Your age, you get more tired when you get a bit older. Your body clock can't regulate itself to, to, to a great degree. How physically fit, how physically aware you are of your own fitness, what you do in terms of your diet, your alcohol intake, intake caffeine intake, all of that, as well as the, the personal issues you have. For instance, we have lots of staff on, on railway infrastructure where we work day shift during the week. And on the Saturday, we'll work on a Saturday night. So your factors during the, the Saturday day, are you, do you have childcare issues? Do you have childcare issues during, during the week that restrict your sleep? If you don't get, as an adult, seven to nine hours sleep a night, you will potentially, almost certainly be fatigued. It's, there's lots of stuff on this. Don't get me wrong, there's lots of stuff from the, the Office of Road and Rail and the RSSB, as well as various other organisations, including the HSE, which give you a ton of great information on this. And a lot of this, you look at this and you go, yeah, that, that's actually quite straightforward. That makes some sense. It's not revolutionary in any way. It's, it's quite basic information. So in terms of what fatigue will do to you, you know, it will, it will impair your performance, I think is, is the kind of overall term here. But, you know, visual performance, cognitive performance, you can't react quickly enough, you can't think quickly enough. Your attention levels go. You can have what's classed as micro sleeps. If you're awake and there was a, an event on the Croydon tram network, which is light rail, 2017, I think I've got a bit of information that later on, where the person was having four to five hours sleep a night and was having micro sleeps, which led to the, the crash, which had seven fail, fatalities involved in it. So these things are physically, we can physically demonstrate, and, uh, and there's been lots of research done that, that will demonstrate this and improve all this. If you're awake for, I think it's about 16 hours plus, it's similar to the, the, the decrease in your cognitive abilities as to the same as having alcohol in your blood at various levels. More, the longer time you spend awake, it's, it's equivalent to having a, 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 an amount of alcohol in your bloodstream, you know, degraded performance. So, and again, feelings of exclusion and irritability, that is a thing that, that comes up. It's sign, how to spot signs of fatigue is a key thing as well. If someone is more irritable or not quite their usual self, it is a sign of various things, but it can be a sign of, you know, of fatigue. So sleep deprivation, I know, I know I've mentioned this a couple of times, there's a lots of uh, lots of very good information available out there from various organisations to do with sleep. And sleep, uh, the, the the actual restorative powers of sleep cannot be underestimated. I know I've said that there. If you get seven or eight hours sleep a night, you'll feel better in the morning. Your body will repair itself effectively when you are asleep. You know, it affects all sorts of other all parts of your body. You know, everything from your memory, as I said, your cognitive ability. Immunity, you know, more susceptible to colds, etc. Things like high blood pressure are very common. Stomach issues, weight gain is, is another issue. If you're working shifts, as I have done for a number of years, you tend to eat maybe the wrong things and potentially at the wrong time of the day or night. There's and that does rise, that give rise to other things like diabetes risk. 
Um, it's it is a an incredible world of science. So you all the things that you've got there about how, how it can affect you is, uh, as I said, it cannot be underestimated, the, the power of, of your actual sleep. Low sex drive is another one in there for, for the gentleman in here as well. Uh, all this stuff affects you in various ways. The, so again, uh, my last one on sleep, I'm not trying to put anyone to sleep with this as well. Uh, I was watching a film recently and I, uh, there was a line in it from a poem that Wilfred Owen wrote in 1970 about men drunk with fatigue a very famous poem and I hadn't realised that obviously a number of years since I've even been near that but even back then the signs of someone being so severely fatigued, fatigued they looked drunk this is due to men during the first world war who were you know effectively stumbling along marching but so tired they looked like they were drunk that now is a proven fact if you are up as I've said for 16 hours plus you will have equivalent uh, capabilities of someone who is under illness of alcohol. So incredible to think that we did that 100 years ago. But we've proven that now. There is lots of other stuff. I remember doing stuff with TUC more than 20 years ago about links back then that were suspected to various forms of cancers, stomach cancers, some breast cancers in women, to do with that regular, irregular pattern of working. When your body tries to regulate itself, your body's producing various things, specifically in the stomach, to regulate itself. Your body's trying to sleep. Well, you're forcing it to, to stay awake and you're feeding your body. You know, mammals generally will sleep when they're tired. Humans have the ability to override that, that need and that body function. So a very difficult thing to manage. And again, the economy, as I said, there are some figures from last year, 40 billion pounds an annum lost in terms of the production of the, to the economy based on lack of sleep, issues to do with lack of sleep. And I mentioned the sleep charity, which has got various organisations, including the Sleep Council involved in it, have got some great information. There's lots of information on their website. They have, there's an annual event they have in terms of focus on sleep, which I, we have tied in before in the real industry, because it is such a big issue for us in terms of working at night when people are hopefully tucked up in their beds, getting seven to nine hours sleep a night. Railway work, project work, maintenance, upgrades, new new stations, new overhead line, et cetera, that we're doing. That happens at night almost exclusively. It's very difficult to manage. So there's a lot of fantastic information out there. So, and again, as I've said, this is a bit of a, an overview. Some people on the call will have seen a lot of this stuff before and may have some great information on what works well, what doesn't work well in terms of how to manage fatigue because it's not an issue we're going to, we're going to remove, I don't think. A few points there on, you know, Chernobyl, Challenger, Exxon Valdez. And I was looking at the Exxon issue, there was a, a comment made by people from, from the Exxon Valdez issue and again that was in the 80s so before a lot of the the law and fatigue was applicable to the UK but there was a comment there that that's just what's expected people were expected to work over and above in what was going be considered a normal seven eight or ten or twelve hour shift people just expected to work to that level so in Clapham was 1988 was the big real one a horrendous event on rail which did lead to some changes in the rail industry where we discovered then that someone uh, had worked 35 shifts in a row without a break which did lead to an error you know uh, so again I apologize for the real bias here there's some specific events that I'm aware of one being and I've I realised when I was doing this, I've mentioned Carillion in this. I haven't mentioned any other organisation and I'm, I'm hoping that that's not going to give me any grief. But Carillion now being defunct, I don't think it's going to cause us any issue. But I, I was at Carillion uh, in the aftermath of this and obviously three fatalities is horrendous. The driver was was charged and convicted. But the, the impact on obviously the family of the, the, the people fatally injured was horrendous. But the impact on everyone else, you're talking about a fairly close-knit depot, people work well together and were shaken by this. And again, this is in advance of Krillian. 
you know, the, the trouble they did have and eventually folding, but that depot was uh, changed. People were moved about, people left that depot and were put in different parts of the business. The impact of this is, is enormous. And that was because people were traveling home when they should have stayed somewhere. The, the second one there was a network rail one, which was again, two, two years later, very similar. So people fell asleep when they were driving when you were expecting to, to, to stay in a hotel and they crashed without an injury because the, the Carillion event, they crashed into a parked HGV. And again, unfortunately, there was a similar one in between those uh, for a for a real organisation, which resulted in a prosecution in 2020. It's so the first prosecution in the UK for, again, it was under, as you would normally see in, in safety prosecutions, Health and Safety Work Act, management regs, not having a sufficient risk assessment, not having a sufficient safe place of work, failure to manage fatigue was that was the first prosecution under what would be classed as fatigue working time regs requirements. And two people unfortunately died in that and it led to a fairly substantial fine and a, presumably a civil fine as well, a civil claim as well. So it's, Again, this is a bit of a real bias, but people who work in various industries, emergency services, various other ones, you know, production, offshore, oil and gas, 24 hours, seven working is, is going to be the norm that you do there. So how do we, how do we learn the lessons from these? How do we, how do we get to a point where we're not having people fatigued? And again, I've got, a, I always put you on a couple of questions in here as well about, have we ever driven home? or, you know, after a long day or a long shift and stopped, had to stop for a while, traveling back from meetings. Again, we're going back into that as we come out of lockdown. We're out, we're out of lockdown now. But as we get out of that, you know, I, I'm traveling three or four hours uh, tomorrow afternoon, but that's not out with my normal day. But how, how do we get to a point where we can own up to that? So, and again, again, apologies for the real biasness, but it just shows you, some of the examples here again we could look at various other ones uh, out with the rail industry but there's a few near misses there incidents where we've had a fatality everything from a fatality to trains traveling with open doors all of which are subject to very detailed reports and very good reports if anyone wants to see the rail accident investigation branch reib's website which is all free you can get all this stuff free very good very detailed reports on all these events so the RSSB, as I've mentioned, the Real Safety and Standards Branch Board, apologies, they've done uh, in 2015, again, it's 2015, but they analysed a number of events and found 21% of those events were fatigue related. 20% according to, sorry, according to current figures of road fatalities are fatigue related. Now, we do, you know, slips and trips will be 50% of yours. Working at height will be a percentage of your events just based on normal HSE stats. If you'd said to me or anyone in the, any safety professional or organisation, you're reporting to your board, you say, well, 20% of our events are fatigue related. Really? Wow, that needs a bit of attention. Should that be on our safety improvement plan? What are we doing about it? That is a fairly significant stat. You know, 20% is a common figure across some detailed analysis of fatalities on road and incidents on track, on railway. So it's fairly, it seems to be quite a common theme there, a common figure. That I think is a fairly significant level. And that now, again, there's a lot of guidance and a lot of this is in terms of the ORR, RSSB, Network Rail, HSE, lots of very good and very interesting research on this some of which is of great value, not just to the rail industry. The ORR document, which is up there, was published 2013, is a fairly hefty tome, but very, very interesting in terms of what you could look at in terms of setting up some sort of management system, some sort of strategy to look at fatigue, understand it, and then hopefully manage it. Now, for those of us who have used the HSE's Fatigue Risk Index tool, which will be a lot of people specifically in rail and I'm imagining out with. It was removed last year from their website, although it is still used. 
that's a statement there from HSE through the front website. I'm presuming people have seen that. Took that off because it's it needs a bit of work and it needs a bit of work on how it should be used as well. So it can be used and we use it. Network Rail still uh, allow that to be used as long as it's done properly. Lots of people do have got various software proprietary systems in place that, that do basically what the FRI tool does, give you the same output in terms of a risk score and a, a numerical figure on your risk ranking. And you can set that to, you know, whatever kind of parameters your own business has got, your own industry has. So, okay, there's another question there that, as I've said at the beginning, I should have said at the beginning, I'm happy to take questions out with this call, out with this meeting, if we can put them in the chat, the Q&A function, I'm happy to take those away and we'll answer that. As well. So it's, it's questions as well as comments. So do you use this tool and is it good? Does it work for you? And what else may work? Um, you know, what, what do organisations currently use? What kind of limits do you work to? Um, so again, fatigue risk management systems, you know, any healthy organisation would ideally have a great system that managed everything from how you plan your shifts, how you work your shifts, how you manage competence, how you manage audits, a number, any number of things you have systems in place to manage. Fatigue management systems, not that common. However, even in the rail industry, and there's a lot of people working rail, a couple hundred thousand people in the UK working rail. If you stay near a, a railway access or a line, you'll probably see us and hear us out in the middle of the night working. So, and there's some key sort of areas there. A leadership, a statement on, yes, we want to fix this issue. Understand what it is, educate people on it. Plan the work effectively so that you, you as to the best of your ability, can put people out to work and not fatigue them. You know, and you should be having occupational health assessments and people you put to work at night. That's what you should be doing in the UK. How often that works, I don't know. But if you have people out of work, you're going to have issues on call. How do you manage people who effectively provide support, including safety? Some people on the call working in rail will be aware of that. People in rail organisations out with the safety team, the kind of engineer and support teams, they will be out there providing support on call, potentially over and above their normal day shift. You know, so there's, there is a, and again, for, for the rail people on the call, there's never real standards, as I'm sure you're aware, are changing the, in October. On call is a big part of that. You know, on call can be considered time at work. So how do you manage someone's time at work if it's at four in the morning when they're providing support to a project when they've worked a day shift and they're going back to work a day shift at eight o'clock the next morning? Big issues for us in terms of how we manage it and potentially as ever, some costly implications for, for organisations there. So road risk driving, as we said, to 20% of fatalities on road are fatigue related, 21% of rail incidents examined by the RSSB are rail related, are fatigue related, sorry. So it's a big issue for us to manage. Driving is a huge issue uh, on track and for lots of other industries. So how do we investigate these KPIs? I'm involved in various organisations, as I know some other people are in the rail industry on the call. KPIs and how we report that. How do we report what's class, classed as an exceedance to working hours, whether that's daily, weekly, monthly? How do we report that? How do we manage that? So it's a very difficult one to manage. So uh, kind of, I'm finishing off here with a few, few questions. So. What can we do to manage this better? How do we manage this? Can we remove the risk of, of, of fatigue to staff? I think in the rail industry, there's no way we're going to change working at night. It's just a fact of the job. You know, we work when trains are in the majority not running. So removing the risk completely, I don't think it's going to be as possible. So we have to then manage it properly. And don't worry, the new network rail standard is, is reasonably good reasonably good. It's, it's very detailed and in various areas like on call and exceedance management and roster shift planning. Gives you some really good information as well as all of the other stuff that's out there. Part of the education programme is how do we 
understand what fatigue is. We have to educate our workforce, educate the management of what fatigue is, what the signs of it, you know, there's some very good organisations in Rio. Some people have seen someone turns up on track and they're not quite themselves. They've not got their boots on. They've not got a hat on. Is that a sign of fatigue or is it just a sign of them you know, not quite being themselves? So education is a key part of this. And then the next thing is how do we own up to that? You know, we'll, we'll, we'll obviously we'll admit and we're quite happy to talk about our sprained ankle and our when we've hurt ourselves that we fell over. Mental and physical well-being should ideally be in the same page and completely linked, but owning up to being fatigued when you turn up on a Saturday night or a Thursday night shift is more difficult than owning up to being physically injured. Difficult and it falls into the, the hopefully better understood world now of mental well-being. So Again, the point there about education cannot be under, understated at all. We really have to be better on fatigue management. And unfortunately, there has been a prosecution relating to fatigue, you know, Health and Safety Work Act, management regs and breaching fatigue management guidelines. Exceptionally difficult for that organisation, but I know that and other organisations have got some exceptionally good measures in place. I know some organisations on track who have got some exceptionally good measures on fatigue management. But similarly, others have some very poor ones. There's lots of issues around one declaring and under, it's fine understanding and then owning up and saying you're fatigued, but lots of people on track are, are engaged and employed in various, in various ways. So if you own up to being fatigued and go home, you won't be getting paid. So there's another whole world of, of issues out there. So again, a question to, to, to the audience is, can we manage it? So that is my question, as I've said slightly earlier on. What's good, what's bad, what works, what doesn't, what systems are good, what is good in terms of engaging with workforce, engaging with management? How do we, as safety professionals, assist in that process and you know, get to a point where we can manage it? Difficult to manage at night shifts, not the, not the best. It's not for everyone. It's not the easiest to work, but it can be managed. And again, a point I put on when I was doing this the other day, my phone was needing charged. And I went, mad. I almost had a panic. Maybe that's just me when my phone went below 50%. But we will turn up on site and turn up in the office when we are tired ourselves. We're physically uh, and haven't had very good conversations on fatigue, specifically in real again. Some people have said they're absolutely shattered. They're physically exhausted. That's a big thing to be able to understand that and to be able to say that. So we want to get a place where people are happy to do that. And again, this goes back to pre-lockdown. Now, as I said, I've been doing fatigue for so long. Um, I'm partially fatigued with it myself, but the, the four day week, some people have heard of the four day week. There's a website as well. New Zealand started this four or five years ago, I'm not sure the exact time scale, where they looked at work-life balance, productivity, stress, anxiety, well-being of staff, and they had a four-day week, paid for five, work four. And it's not about working longer days, it's, it's trying to work a wee bit more effectively, but understanding that you will have four days to work and have a better work-life balance, potentially be less fatigued, less stressed, more mentally uh, aware and slightly and better mental physical and mental health worked exceptionally well. Obviously, lockdown has, as I said, taken over that slightly. And I'm, I'm, you see some good signs and some signs of it going back the way slightly. That organisations are far more aware now of what their companies and their, their employees need. Barclays Bank, for example, the city of London. I was in the city of London last year during the week. Everybody's ever been to the city of London, one of the busiest places on the planet during the week, empty at night. I was during the day, I was in the city of London last year, it was empty. Unusual. All of your sandwich bars and coffee bars and stuff like that are now, that moves somewhere else. That money just goes somewhere else. Barclays Bank, 80% of their staff, London, city of London, hybrid working, more profitable than they've ever, than profitable than they've ever been. So businesses can adapt, can change, can understand. We just don't want that to drift back into the 
not saying that the bad old days of where everyone was sort of standing at attention at their, at their desk, but it's it's certainly a, a thing we need to keep an eye on. And just a, a quick question at the end, there's a term I came across, I don't know, 10 years ago, uh, crochet. If anyone could tell me what it means, there'll be some sort of bonus. We've got some kind of commendation from, from the speaker here. Uh, I've just realised that we're not, uh, not at an open forum, but Kiroshi is a, a term, a Japanese term for death by overwork. So you've got where we are just now, I think, in a reasonably good place and, and try to understand and have a, some some acceptance that we need to, to manage this better to the, again, a different culture, but an accepted death by overwork where people are compensated for and replaced, if you like, uh, after death by overwork. So that is that. Um, as I've said, happy to take comments, questions on this itself and anything else to do with fatigue, sleep, stress. I'm certainly not an expert, but I've done a fair bit of work on it and I'm working with various groups on that at the moment. So anyone that's got comments in there in terms of that, we'll try and address those just now. But feeling that, we're happy to take those away and discuss and come back to people or come back to people via the branch by some sort of feedback. We'll do that as well. So thank you very much for your time. Thank you, I appreciate that. Thank, thank you, Keith. On behalf of the branch, thank you very much for that. We all know that the fatigue and, and, you know, and the way we work uh, becomes difficult, especially through the furlough um, months where people were at home and, OK, the sun was shining, but uh, certainly fatigue can get in for doing nothing. There's a few questions and a few comments here. Um, one of the questions is, is it down to the individuals not taking breaks? Or, or even reporting lack of sleep and no support from an employer or perhaps peer pressure. You know, if you, as you said, you have a, a sleepless night and you get into your work the next day, depending on what you're doing, uh, you know, um, if you're, you know, on the, on the clock, you're, you're going to be a wee bit reticent to say, I hardly slept last night. Yeah, it's, it's difficult. Again, with a bit of a railway bias, another defunct organisation, Jarvis, uh, track Reels Division, or TRD as they were known, and it, I think if there's a few people who may be ex-Jarvis on the call, it used to be a very common sort of standing joke, there was no T in TRD because he didn't get a break. He worked. <laughs> that was accepted back then, that's over, over 10 years ago, obviously. Railway tends to be very short time on track, you know, one o'clock in the morning when trains are away, you're on until six in the morning when the trains are back limited time to do any work. In some cases you get extensions to that, but it can be a culture where breaks are just not the norm, genuinely. You do a survey on surveys on fatigue, which I'm doing various projects at the moment. We ask people about if they get breaks at all. You know, welfare on track is not the norm in terms of a canteen facility. If you're in a project on track somewhere, there's no welfare. You know, physically nothing. So, do you get a, you could have a break, but you'd be having a break standing at the side of the track. It's not the best. So, that's what the point about understanding it is the key point to start. You know, educate your staff on what fatigue is. How do they understand they are fatigued? If you're finishing a night shift and you've got kids to take to school, then pick them up at three. You're not going to get seven or nine hours sleep. And it's during the day. It's noisy. It's the summer. It's warm. Lots of things happening during the day. You won't get adequate sleep and you go to work that night again. It's then understanding that and being able to say, I am tired, I am fatigued. Your organisation should be in a position where they have a, a robust system that says, if someone says they're fatigued, here's what we do. We raise it. We have replacements available. We have other people we can move into that role. That tends not to be the norm as well, unfortunately. Mm. The other one is uh, presenteeism. Could this be an issue? Um, yeah. Certain bits where, you know, you leave at five, you're only contracted to work to five, and as you're leaving at five, somebody's looking at their watch going, you know, uh, it's it can be a, a challenge sort of leaving an office or a workplace at the right time. Presenteeism, presenteeism is, I don't think that's so much that. Presenteeism, presenteeism is going to work when you know you probably shouldn't. You know, again, COVID, Zero hours contracts. Mm. Again, a lot of people who work on track. Again, that's an apologies for the real bias there, but lots of people in construction 
and various other industries world have the same issue, whether it's COVID related or fatigue related or a cold or whatever you've got, you go to work because if you don't, you won't be getting paid. Now that is a huge, I mean, how do we remove that risk? I mean, that is a huge cultural change for the UK to even consider. How that's done, I don't know, but yes, that is absolutely an issue, yeah. Mm -hmm. you, you mentioned uh, weekend night shifts on, on the, the, the rail because that, that's uh, probably a, an easier time or a better time for this work to carry it out. Do you think people that are going out in the night shift at the weekend are chasing the money or is it peer pressure or is it a bit of both? It's a bit of both. Uh, it can be both. I did it. I, I worked in engineering where I worked various that that thing that statement about a regular irregular pattern which was awful you know one on three off two on four off all that kind of thing so railway day shift safety and then proceeded to work every Saturday night for 10 years so you do that and people are your body works a normal week you sleep during the night you get up on Saturday morning at some point but you're going to work at 10 or 11 on a Saturday night you do, do not get enough sleep on the whole, on average, based on survey data, you do not physically get enough sleep during the day before you go to work on Saturday night. Then Sunday morning, that's technically your rest period from a work day. So there's a whole other argument about transition days and rest days and where you should have any paid period before you go back to work. But later, under the law at the moment, you have 12 hours, 11 hours rest under working time regs. 12 hours rest period under network rules guidelines and their standards. So yeah, it's a it's a huge issue. I, mean, I did it because it was overtime. Lots of people will do the same, but lots of people that will be there contracted six days a week. Railways, you know, five, six shifts a week is what you do as the norm. Mm -hmm. Just when you said there about the, the 12 hour uh, rest period, SAC, you've got the same principle. The, you know, if they're anywhere uh, and even that includes driving home so if they're yeah. down and, and they, I think they've got a limit of 140 miles in any one day or something like that and if you finish at 7 o'clock at night you're not expected to be to be back in the next morning uh, or next day yeah. for 12 it, hours it is, it, that, the network are quite good at that the network ones are good and bad it's a 12 hour, most organisations have moved to 12 hours door to door, as it's called. So when you leave your place of rest to when you return, it's 12 hours, including your shift and travel, which is good. Mm -hmm. That's okay. There's an allowance in the aerial standards to that, be slight to be, for that to be slightly above that. But lots of organisations are down to that 12 hours. 12 hours work, 12 hours rest. That's a pretty good, you know, it's reasonable. I think there, there's still some questions on that in terms of, how you actually manage that and the impact it does have on your shift times and how, how long you're allowed to travel. Various organisa organisations have limits on travel as well. NetRail themselves have a limit on travel and then you have to lodge somewhere. Yeah, and yeah, the submariners in the Royal Navy are four hours on, four hours off. Mm. They, they, and that comes from Admiral Nelson's day where he says that you're more alert if you're four hours on and then four hours off. But the, and that, that's not really changed. Couple of things, uh, not so much questions. Um, it, d can you get a contact in the sleep charity for anybody? We can put that up on the website. Yes, absolutely. Um, the the sleep charity are very good. There's a, a woman who's involved with that. It's called Lisa Artis, I think her name is, but you'll find her on LinkedIn on the sleep charity. Um, there's yep, one. Absolutely. There's one just come in here. Um, does anyone know of a good course for line managers to introduce them to the impact of fatigue? Uh, we have a lot of new young supervisors who aren't really aware of it. And you've got to remember, the younger they are, you know, okay, they can sleep around the clock at the weekend, but there can be, uh, you know, a lot of energy in the younger uh, yeah. generation. In terms of that, I've developed some training and some, you know, briefings on various topics, you know, diet, exercise, sleep. How, you, how the process works, various other aspects of fatigue. And I've used stuff from what was the Sleep Council and, the, and now the Sleep Charity. There's lots of resources on that, on, you know, different organisations, workplaces, home, how, how to actually get better sleep and how to, but they, they, they have a thing there on workplace reps and appointing people in workplaces who are, you know, your safety team are kind of probably going to be pointed at for that. But, you know, you're the, the safety person, the safety rep, whoever, whoever you are. You could become the sleep 
rep, you know, that kind yes. of thing. There's lots mm. of information on that website on how to do that. Plus your, it, your presentation will be up on the IOS website yeah. as well absolutely, with the, yeah. the diet, the fatigue, all the good points, etc., etc. I mean, you take those points, for it, the page on what a management system might look like, you know, an understanding and awareness of wanting to accept that issue, awareness and education of people, how to recognise it, how to spot it, diet, exercise, sleep. You know, there's there's half a dozen topics already that you can get stuff quite readily on the internet. In terms of a course, I'm generally not aware of any specific courses on. I think generally, if you've got the good information, it can be a, a kind of 10, 15 minute uh, briefing yeah. come toolbox talk. That's what we tend to do. I mean, without being, <laughs> without being funny, we'd be generally we'd try not to bore people to death or fatigue them with yeah. an hour long yeah. presentation. It's, yeah. it's snapshots of what can be good for your diet, your sleep pattern, your exercise. You know, couple of minutes. shared, uh, sorry, Keith, a couple of shared yeah. things here. There's an Edinburgh-based uh, organisation, IHF, I don't know who they are actually, are doing research on human factors and ergonomics with a real specific approach on that as well. And secondly, <clears throat> another uh, member in the meeting has developed an e-driving app designed to improve driver safety, measuring hours behind the wheel. And that, that's fine if it's a company vehicle, but you're saying there, your, your, your team, even in the rail industry, could you know drive a train, go yeah. and work, and then have to drive an hour and twenty minutes to and from longer, work, which yeah. is or the, longer. There's yeah. been some Morgan Sindel. I don't know if anyone more from Morgan Sindel was on the call. Their rail division did some excellent work on this. I mean, they started doing this uh, five, six, seven years ago at least. And they started with getting fit bands, ready bands, I think it was, or whatever they had to measure managers, staff you know, track operatives, fatigue, how they sleep, and were astonished by the results. Uh, there's some great stuff by Judith Devlin from Morgan Sindel. She's done, I think she's done some stuff for IOSH, I'm not sure, but they took that initial data and were shocked by it and then worked after that and done some great, well, I did a presentation in 2018 with Judith associated with the sleep charity, the sleep council, sorry. And they're kind of annual. They've got an event which sounds a bit odd. It's called Sleep Timber, which is another kind of focus month. And we, we tied that in with your physical, mental well-being, and your sleep and the benefits of it all. But yeah, th there's some really interesting data when you start to analyse that. And I think that was for organisations who do that have done that. I've looked at the, the data from from Morgan Sindel, astonished by the data. Yeah, is what they were when they got it, including managers and senior managers who are on their phones and laptops all hours of the day and night and travelling a lot back then. So, And lastly, um, it's certainly slightly different for uh, management and supervisory roles. Um, I know from personal experience, I've got a gentleman who's uh, near retirement and we've, we, he, we agreed that he could work three days a week, which suits his work-life balance. But for well, I say it was specifically for scaffolding, but provisions for the older workforce because you get older, you're not as fit and not as agile as you once were, and, and you're more cautious as well. And yeah. do you do you have provisions within the, the rail industry for the, the older workforce, or is there any? <laughs> no, you they just get they just play, <laughs> play them down by the side of the track. They tend not to have them on the end of a shovel as much. No. Yeah. <laughs> No, absolutely. It's difficult. You do have increased periods of, of medical scrutiny when you get above 40, for example. That's just a kind of the standard. But when you people put people to work at night, as I mentioned, you're not, you should be having a, an assessment of them. Occupational health assessment of people who work nights. That's yeah. what you should be doing in the UK. You know, it, it tends as a... a there's some good signs, there's some good stuff happening out there, there's some good understanding of certainly organisations I'm working in and within Network Rail centrally because they involve lots of people from all sorts of organisations to develop different strategies and one is absolutely ongoing at the moment for fatigue, providing guidance. It tends not to be the norm within organisations though to do that. No, uh, uh, thank you very much Keith, That's, that was very, very interesting from somebody who uh, sometimes wakes up in the middle of the night and can, sometimes can't get back to sleep because things are going through your mind. It's it's very interesting to hear about the whole industry. 
it as is, well. It is, and I, don't get me wrong, I've done that as well, and I've used there's some good simple tips on things like the, the Sleep Council Sleep Charities website, which you know are easily doable. Don't sit with your phone or your tablet at night. You know, try and read. Don't drink caffeine as much. Don't drink alcohol as much. If that is a sleep inhibitor. You know, when you set up your room slightly differently, there's, you can listen to music. It might sound odd. There's a, a few things readily available, free, freely available on YouTube and Spotify or about music that is designed to assist you in sleeping. I have I've listened to it. It's fantastic, some of it. Mm -hmm. So there's lots of stuff out there that's not a, a huge expense for anyone to, to look at and experiment with if they have an issue sleeping. It's a bit more difficult if you're your wife's beside you sleeping and <laughs> you're listening to ACDC during the night. But hey, no, no, thank well, you very much, Steve. That, yeah. um, thank uh, you. That's all the questions that, that I've thank had. Thank you very much. And uh, no, on behalf of the branch, thank you very much. And uh, we, we'll look forward to looking at the presentations on the website. And I see there's a few links coming in. Uh, the shipping industry, MGN 505 from MCA is good information. So we'll get all that up on the website. I'll hand back over to the chair, but thank you very much, Keith. Thank much you. appreciated. Chair, back to you.